Welcome to the Almost Rocket Science Podcast, an ongoing discussion on the world of STEM. Welcome to the first episode of Almost Rocket Science, a STEM-themed podcast. We're really excited to be coming to you tonight. My name is Jeff Burgeon, and I'm the host of Almost Rocket Science. Before we get too far into this episode, we'd like to explain to you exactly what this product is all about. As we mentioned, it is a STEM-themed or science, technology, engineering, and math uh, based podcast and really the goal here was originally to inspire my students but I decided that it was more important to reach not only my students but students outside my classroom I really wanted to inspire them to look into STEM careers and see the potential that might lie within those careers for them so almost rocket science is actually a podcast and an adjoining blog and it's an idea of mine but I couldn't do this all on my own. So I went out and got the help of my friend, Rhett Youngberg, who happens to be your average high school student who just likes science. And come on, who doesn't? But his real love is for technology. And he's going to be helping me out not only with the website and the blog, but he is going to be helping me record this podcast from time to time as well, like he did this week. He's also going to be working on a wonderful segment called Gadget Garage or something along those lines. As our resident gadget guru here at Almost Rocket Science, he's going to take the time to go out and discover, investigate new techno gadgets, new things that you really want to go out and get. And he's going to show us how to unlock their full potential and put them to good use in our lives. So we're really looking forward to that segment. He's even hinted at some really neat gadget, maybe giveaways. So you'll want to really pay attention not only here, but on the site. Since the goal of Almost Rocket Science is to get an ongoing conversation started about STEM, we went out and kicked off our first episode with a great interview. It's, in fact, we got such an awesome guest, we're not even sure how we did it. But we're very thankful that he agreed. And you know our guest as none other than the host of the Science Channel's Build It Bigger. If you're a fan of the show, you already know who I'm talking about. But for those of you who don't, that's right, we went out and got Danny Forster. I mean, Danny Forster, do you realize this guy is a TV host and he's doing really awesome stuff. Not only does he host a television show, but he's got a lot of neat projects in the hopper. And we'd like to share those with you through this interview based on not only our questions, but my students' questions. So we're really excited that not only did he answer those in such a great way, he gave us some really valuable insights not only into his life, the show, but STEM careers in general. So sit back and enjoy. We're in the studios today with uh, Danny Forster of Build It Bigger. We're really excited to have him, and we'd like to get started with a little bit of conversation about the show. First off, we're huge fans of the show. We love, love, love it. I mean, uh, the behind-the-scenes aspects that you show and share with us and uh, just really inspire students. We can see it makes our learning you know, come to life, which we appreciate, especially as a teacher. And we really appreciate that you do teach through the show, too. It's not just a, just a show for fun. We try. Exactly. So what is really the goal and from your end of the show, would you say? Sure. Um, you know, it's a it's a funny show in some regard because it's not a pure construction engineering architecture show. It's not a, a travel show, and it's not necessarily a kind of a how to build a skyscraper show or how to build a bridge show. Mm -hmm. It's um, for me the goal is to kind of demonstrate that these projects, be they skyscrapers or stadiums or bridges or or tunnels, um, are more than their kit of parts. In other words, it's not just about building a tunnel that goes through the Andes, which is super deep and very dangerous, but it's about the impact of that tunnel bringing water to the west side of Peru, which will allow farmers to farm and maybe change the economy of the country. Or, you know, we should did a show in Kuwait about this amazing twisting skyscraper called mm -hmm. Alhamra. It wasn't just about that it was tall. I mean, it was tall. 1,400 feet is tall. It's not the tallest. But what we want to demonstrate is that the shape of the tower, the form of the tower, the geometry, the way in which it's being built, is important because Kuwait is now liberated. You know, with the fall of Iraq, it's a big moment for this country. And this is their first big building they're building. And so it's about how can a tower, how can technology, how can design represent the aspirations of a country. So I guess if I were to summarize it, it's that that you may not be an architect, you may not necessarily love concrete and steel, but you can get behind the, the time, like for Singapore, a country that wants to reinvent itself, doing it through a building. Mm -hmm. um, that these projects are significant and they're... Um, they are more than just the height or the weight of the steel or the or the complexity of the curve. They're bigger than that. That's cool. We that's a neat aspect too because we don't always think about the cultural impacts of that. Totally, totally. So. And that's and that's one of the nice things about doing the show um, as a kind of an immersive experience where you go to Abu Dhabi or this year Azerbaijan or 
Peru or Rio, you go to these cultures and you have an idea of what you want to do. I mean, I know like, okay, like this building in Australia in, in Melbourne's built a certain way. I kind of, I know the architects, I have a sense of what's going on, but it's not until you're kind of in it with the workers, with the people shooting around the city, you know, actually getting your hands dirty, do you actually understand the impact of the, of the show? And that's why it's also so fun for me to make because I don't have the answers. I have, I have the questions. I have a, a sense of where I want to go. We work very hard to prepare ourselves, but you know, you get there. What's happening is different than what you expect. Your experience is different than what you thought it would be. And so the story that kind of comes out of it, I hope, is sort of informed by you know, our anticipation and our questions, but ultimately what we discover. So it's, it is a real documentary in that regard. That's cool. And so as a trained architect, you're still a student, in fact. Mm. Through that process, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I'm a I'm a professor. I teach a studio this semester at Syracuse, and um, and I have a practice, a design practice in Brooklyn. Um, but you know, anyone will tell you that design is a is a uh, is a long, long haul, and you yeah. spend three and a half years in grad school, and you just get started. You really just get started. And and for sure, what I get to do is like I'm frankly I'm a young designer. I'm only a couple of years out of graduate school, and I'm still getting my bearings, building my first few projects. So when I get to meet, you know, whether it's Peter Eisenman or the architects of Skidmore, Owens, and Merrill who are doing these seriously groundbreaking projects, right? Some of the most important ones in the world. I am like an apprentice meeting some of the masters, very much learning about what's happening out in the field because we're seeing projects where folks are doing things that haven't been done before. There's certainly things that I'm not doing. And so I am absolutely a student, a curious, well-informed student nonetheless, but just a student out there amazed by what I'm seeing and trying to figure it out. Yeah. I, I, I know what I'm doing a little bit, but not, not a lot of the time. Um, we appreciate the honesty there. Uh, definitely good for the students to hear that, too. Um, so why don't you just walk us through a production of an episode? Sure, sure. Yeah, that's, I'm glad you're asking that, because I think people, I think we do some tricks to make people think things that aren't necessarily the case, um, and I'm happy to reveal how we actually do it, because um, people always say, oh, well, you must be there for months, you must go back multiple times, you know. Um, no. Uh, we're there for 10 days one visit, consecutive days, and that's it. And this is a perfect time to ask me this question because literally on Friday I leave from Mumbai to begin the next season. So perfect example is Mumbai. Uh, the architects SOM, Skidmore, Owens, and Merrill, who I know because they're doing, we've done projects of theirs in the past, we're actually, they're the architects of Tower One yeah. at Ground Zero, so we're very involved with them. Uh, for this new show we're doing called The Rising. And so SOM says to me, Danny, we have this killer project, check it out, what do you think? It's Mumbai, super big international terminal, zillions of people, slumdog millionaire, crazy design, check it out. So we look at it, we check out the renderings, we hear about the design, we say to ourselves, we're into it, we love it. Yeah. So we begin our research phase. We spend about four weeks researching the project, talking to the architects, talking to the owners, talking to the construction managers, and also most importantly, begging for access. Because we also need to get the ability to go in there and make TV for a week. Yeah. Uh, we lined it all up, everything worked. About two weeks ago, we got it. Visa process begins, visas are in. I'm on a plane on Friday. So on Friday I leave, I'll spend 10 days in India. And during those 10 days, we'll probably shoot between eight and nine days, literally running around every inch of the construction site. Uh, we have a plan of what we want to do. We have a sense by talking to the construction management team where they're at. But you know, if you've ever tried to redo your bathroom, you don't know what's going to be happening four days from now, let alone yeah. four weeks from now. So we hope there'll be a lot of acti activity going on. So we'll spend 10 days shooting, and the hope is to get into every nook and cranny that will help us both kind of celebrate what's innovative about the design, but what's also unique about the culture. Mm -hmm. So we want to get into what's the existing airport like in India? What are the conditions they're responding to, and what are they trying to make better? So 10 days, myself, my cameraman Jason, uh, will fly. Uh, oh, and by the way, I should also tell you that we are a very small crew. There's myself, host and producer, Jason Longo, director of photography, will have a producer with us, in this case a wonderful guy named Steven. We'll have a sound man with us, and that's it. We're a team of four. We're very, very small. We're one camera crew. We're there for 10 days. We'll give the tapes to Steven, our, uh, our incredible producer, who will then take the tapes back to Powderhouse Productions in Boston, where they'll start editing the show. I'll then fly on to the next episode, which in this case will be the Second Avenue subway in New York City. Um, and then for the next eight weeks, after we get back, Steven, our editor, and myself will be working to go through the tapes to take essentially about 20 hours of footage and compress it into 47 minutes. <laughs> and all the while, maintain the integrity of the content, mm -hmm. really describe the things we're trying to get at, make the show fun, make it compelling, make it honest, and, uh, and, and that's it. And so the whole thing goes from four weeks of research, two weeks of shooting, eight weeks of editing and writing, and then it's on TV. 
and they stuff it full of commercials and, and commercials and, and animation and voiceover and the whole thing. And so we're going to do that essentially that same thing I just described. We'll do it ten times straight. And the way we the way we do them quickly, or we try to do them quickly, is that I generally will go from country to country. So in this case, I'll go um, from India back to New York to shoot the New York show. I'll go straight from New York. Uh, to London to do our next show about the Aquatic Center, an amazing building designed mm. by Zaha Hadid for the New Olympics in London. And so we more or less go straight from country to country, and then we have a kind of staggering team of post-production, editing and writing and animating the shows. So you're pretty hands-on with the editing at the end, too, in the post-production? Absolutely. Um, well, you have to be in the sense that if you're out, number one, if you're out there living it, experiencing it, like those 20, 30 hours of footage, you're, you're in every moment. You kind of know where the gems are, you know where the ideas are. But the other part of it also is that, you know, I'm not a host in the sense that I'm not a game show host. Um, like, there are no cue cards. These ideas are as much my own as they are the producers. And, and I frankly, I do believe it's important to to bring a kind of designer's mentality to the, to, the, to the story. It's not, you know, we really pride ourselves on not just doing what a lot of our competitors do, which is that, say, it's this big, it's this heavy, it's this dangerous. Maybe we'll say that too, but we also want to help you understand the specificity of the curve, uh, uh, the importance of a kind of glass wall system. And that, to me, comes a lot from my experience as, a, as, an, as you know, trained as an architect. And so, yeah, I am, I am pretty hands-on, probably much to the... Uh, the editor's chagrin at times. Maybe I'm too hands-on, but but I think we have a we have a, at Powderhouse Productions we have a kind of an amazing, wonderful family. We've been making the show together for four years now. Okay. Um, so yeah. And this is technically a spin-off, would you say, of Extreme Engineering, right? I mean, that's what people say. Anyhow. Yeah, I mean, I guess so. Like when I when I got the job initially, Extreme Engineering was a, a kind of an unhosted construction documentary. Yeah. It was what you just talked about. We're gonna tell you all about the size, the weight, weight, and the height, and, and this, and, and this is awesome. But yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. And it, you know, was it was a cool show for what it was. I don't think it was really engrossed in the content. I think it was more about construction. It didn't have a life though. I didn't as much I didn't, as this I, does. Yeah, I wasn't. A, I mean, I wasn't a massive fan of it. When I got my job, they said, "Put him in front of the camera on Extreme Engineering, see what happens." And so I hosted six episodes of Extreme Engineering, and I and I, you know, a lot. Of, I look back at those and I kind of I'm a bit embarrassed. I mean, there I didn't know what I was doing. It was a bit of a spaz. We didn't know it. No one. I mean, there wasn't at that point a hosted construction format. There wasn't a. There was no precedent. So we didn't know. Really, it was like, all right, follow the kid around, see what he gets trouble he gets into. And so really, it was just I was in grad school still. I was, you know, I didn't. I hadn't spent much time on a construction site. Anyway, we shot those episodes, but as as rough as they were, I think Discovery saw something in them and said to me, as soon as I graduated, I went back, finished my thesis, graduated um, with my master's, and then Discovery said, do you want to try it again? We'll give you your own show, we'll start from scratch, uh, let's, let's give it a shot. And so that's how Build It Bigger was born. So yeah, I guess it's a spinoff, it's sort of... Um, the idea was that extreme engineering had its own thing; it's its own sort of unhosted thing. And what we were experimenting with was new. So, start fresh, build it bigger, see what you can get into. And that was that was you know that was three and a half, four years ago when that happened. So it's it's been a we've been doing it for a little bit now. We're we're getting you know we still think of ourselves as so new to this, but we've been doing it a little bit of time. Well, I got to say, even from a teaching perspective, when I would show extreme engineering when I did it with my high school students. It was kind of those, you just look out there and the faces are like, well, that's kind of cool, but that's it. But now that you see Build It Bigger, it has that life. They really get involved. You draw them in, which is really nice. So I appreciate that. We, we take, I think we take the pedagogical aspect pretty seriously because, mm-hmm. you know, we, 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 the, to give you more kind of behind the scenes lingo inside our office when we're talking about it, we're, the question we ask ourselves is what's the aha moment? Mm-hmm. What's the moment where when you find out a piece of information, you go, oh, now I get it. And that piece of information is never the height of the building. Because if you look at a building, I'm like, hey, check out the Empire State Building. Guess what? It's 1,100 feet tall. You're not like, oh, it's not. you don't know more or less than you did a minute ago. You just know its height. I want to know there's a river in the basement. Exactly, exactly. Like, it, it, you know, that building is twisting. Why? Because that's south and that's north. And that, build, that way it twists, protects yeah. it from the heat. Oh, with that piece of information, I look back at the building and I see more. It's almost like we give our audience, we hope, x-ray glasses that with yeah. these aha bits of information they look back at the building and they understand more and so we always ask ourselves with every sequence of every segment we shoot this is not how to build a skyscraper not it's, the nuts and bolts it's not nuts and bolts it's not um what, what you know uh bob vila it's not this old <laughs> house or this cool house or this big house it's not about that yes we're putting a piece of glass in yes i'll explain the mechanics of the installation but it's more why is this glass important how does this glass make this atrium transform the building? So we, we always want to give you a taste of the nuts and bolts, but we'll never, sp- we always pull back. 
mm-hmm. and we want to think about the, the kind of the bigger ideas, not necessarily the kind of like. And now the window's installed. <laughs> you know, like it's it's not about that. I still love Tom Silva. So whatever. no, I mean, yeah. I, I think I think every, I think you know I think uh, for when you rip apart your bathroom, you need to know exactly. that exactly. I mean, but if you want to put in like a geothermal system, and God knows I've done it on some projects, I wish I knew more about it. And I'm glad some shows will actually show you how to do that. Yeah, um, we we just go a different route. That's cool. So along that line, how do you go about picking your projects? That's another really great question, and I think it's. Um, a real window into the kind of the bizarre, wonderful kind of alchemy that is our show because, you know, in the case, like I, you know, being involved in architecture and, and connected to a lot of these folks, I'll come, I'll come up with a bunch of projects. Um, Discovery Channel might get some projects they'll give us. Powderhouse Productions has a research team. They come up with some projects. Um, frankly, this year, uh, we have one, one, maybe two projects that came off my Twitter page. Quite literally, for those out there, two projects that we'll do this year came from Twitter to me, I followed up, and they're becoming a TV show. So that is real, totally real. But anyway, so imagine between these sources of information, we get, let's say, 10 or 15 or 20 ideas we like. We do some preliminary research. Number one is, is it good? Is it interesting? Is it compelling? Is it more than just tall? Is it more than just big? Is there something really going on that we care about? Number one. Number two is, is it under construction and about 50 to 75% complete? Because one of the things folks don't realize is that if you're only there for 10 days, you have to see it in a way that if you squint your eyes and have a little bit of animation, you can imagine the finished product. It's just no good to go to a skyscraper when they're putting fat piles in the ground, right? So it's got to be kind of at our, at our sweet spot. And then finally, it has to be having enough going on at this period in time that if I show up for 10 days, there'll be a multiplicity of activities. So that's sort of it. And then we kind of put them together. We pitch them to Discovery. Ultimately, you know, they are the final arbiter. We say, this is cool. This is happening. This is happening. They say, cool, cool, not cool, 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 not cool. And, um, and then we start buying plane tickets. Nice. As long as they buy them, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I don't buy the plane tickets. Thank goodness. Well, that's good. Uh, you have any uh, ideas for any future seasons as far as some different things that are maybe down the road in yeah. the pipe? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, there's lots of projects that are just, that are just not there yet. Um, I mean, for sure, I mean, everything that's happening at Ground Zero, you know, we're doing a much long form, longer form documentary called The Rising for Discovery. We've been, we've been here for a year and a half. We'll be there for more time. Um, that's something that will be ripe for Build It Bigger probably uh, in, in about six or eight months for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there's a couple of great projects we want, we want, I want to look into. There's some amazing skyscrapers going up in South Korea that mm-hmm. are not quite there for us yet, but they will be. Um, so yeah, there's, we always kind of track the kind of six months, one year, five years kind of projects. Yeah. You have to do that. Keep looking at the long term too. Yeah, exactly. Which is good. Now, this is definitely going to be, we're going to touch on it with a student question too, but given your fear of heights, what's going through your mind as you look up and realize I'm going up there? Yeah. Um, (laughs) it's not not, to embarrass you. No, 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 no. I mean, look, I'm one of the things that I I would say to your students, that's a big part of the show is that, you know, I'm not an actor and, and this is not about, uh, world's toughest host. It's fairly straightforward about the fact that some things totally freak me out. And I would say with good reason, when you're hanging off the side of a building in like a little gondola and you're looking down, you can see like cars that big, it's pretty frightening. But by the way, if you ever have a moment where you say, that's it, season's over, I quit again. Call me. I'll, I'll take you. over. <laughs> You're not the first person who said that to me. I'm sure. Um, but um, Yeah, I mean, I think for sure, like when we're shooting for a week, and I know like on Wednesday, we're going to be doing that sequence up there with the tiles, and it's really high, and it's Monday, and I'm definitely not sleeping well Monday and Tuesday night, for sure. I'm kind of like, oh, oh, oh when's that going to be over? Um, but I will say, increasingly, as, as Jason, my, my cameraman and practical co-host, as we've gotten into more and more nasty stuff over the years, Number one, we've gotten better about the safety. We, we don't just like throw a harness on and jump out of a window. We, we know the safety, so we're being really mindful about it. And the other kind of thing that's been kind of exciting is that it become, you, you start to taste that thing that daredevils must feel, where it's like, let's do this. Like, let's, go, let's go a little farther this time. You know, this time, let's try and photograph it from there. Because we shot it this way last time, and that was cool, but we never did it this way. So now, we, now we're at the point where, so long as we, we can cover the safety, because, I mean, look, this is not a demonstration. The risks are real. People do get killed on construction sites. And so we, we do try and take it as seriously as one can. Uh, but we, you know, I think we are getting to the point where it's like, we want to push it a little bit each time. We want to kind of like go just a little further each time. You, you must look at those old pictures of the skyscrapers going up here in New York and be like, what were those guys thinking? I mean, just the fact that people, look, even today, I mean, look, I love every iron worker. 
God bless the union boys. They do amazing things. I still do not understand why people don't wear, where people get frustrated about tying off. I, I just don't get it. I mean, I tie off. I love tying off. Tying off makes me so happy. I like 100% tie off. Every time I clip my carabiner, I'm happier than the next carabiner. I mean, I love tying off. Tying off is basically like, when you fall, you won't die. Those two clauses are great clauses. I, the show I, can't go on without you. Either. I mean, I appreciate that. But, like, I just... Like, when we were climbing, if you saw the Bay Bridge episode, we walked up oh, the yeah. cable. Mm-hmm. You know, it was like... I, I, They had to probably cut this out of so much of the tape. It was like, tie off one, tie off two, 100%. But they didn't give you the Mike Rowe treatment where afterwards they told you there's an elevator that brings you up to the top, right? Oh, there's no elevator on the span of the Bay Bridge. I figured. It's uh, too old. If, if there's was, if there was an elevator, I would have taken it. Uh, especially when you're done, you made it to the top, you're like, oh, all the adrenaline goes out of your system, yeah. then all the pain you feel from your tension comes up, and then you're like, I have to get down. Because <laughs> in many ways, the way down is much worse, because at that point, your knees have, are shot, your elbows are hurting, your muscles are blown. I, I actually I remember going down just, like, miserable. <laughs> you wish there was, like, a slide. I practically, I was going right? so fast, I was like... I wanted off that thing so badly. Mm-hmm. I was done. We were cooked. Yeah, that was a bad one. Well, that's good. We want to move beyond the show a little bit too, mm-hmm. and uh, talk about what other projects you have going on. We know you, you obviously have your own firm. Yeah, you're teaching, and we do want to talk about the rising a little bit. So maybe you can give us some background on sure, that too. Sure, sure. Um, well, the rising is uh, uh, something that's really, really important to me. It's a project I started about about a year ago now, um, which is going to be we hope to be a kind of a the definitive chronicling of the rebuilding of Ground Zero. And um, I started talking to the Port Authority about a year ago about access and, and about the possibility of doing this. And with their support, Discovery Channel came on board and very, very um, wonderfully, Steven Spielberg came on board, which is amazing, wild, you know, <laughs> crazy. And, um, and we've partnered with an incredible director, an incredible production company of a wonderful team in which the same production facility you're sitting in right now. And we are doing, it'll be about a two year period of time where we're filming almost three to four times a week, overnight, sometimes in Europe, going to the factories where they're making the steel. And it'll be a six hour documentary that'll look at Tower One, it'll look at the memorial pools, it'll look at the museum, it'll look at the transportation hub, and it'll look at Towers Two, Three, and Four, and it'll look at it through the lens of architecture. You're going to meet the designers, the engineers, the contractors, the politicians, the bureaucrats who are building this thing. You're going to see how it goes up. You're going to understand why the design is the way it is. You're going to go to other countries to see how this incredible steel is fabricated. You're going to be there at four in the morning when the first tree gets delivered to go into the plaza. Uh, You're going to be there when they first test the water at the memorial pools. You'll be there with family members um, to go see the names of their lost loved ones in the, in the, uh, in the bronze panel. Uh, you're going to be there when the architects pick out the marble for the lobby. You'll be there when the iron workers top off the building. So it's going to be, to be perfectly honest, it's not going to be about politics. It's not going to be about budget. It's going to be about the aspirations of this master plan, this design, and how it defines our response to what happened in 9-11. So it's a forward-thinking documentary about the incredible hard work that, frankly, no one knows about. People are like, oh, it's late. Oh, what's going on there? Are they, are they building anything? There's a big fence up and no one really knows. But the thing is, amazing things have been happening on that site. And so hopefully this project will tell that. And it's called The Rising and it should air six hours each week leading up to 9-11-11, the 10 year anniversary. So we have about, about a year or more to go. So that's the other TV project, which I'm extraordinarily proud of and really, really, um, I, I feel very passionately about. Um, my office, uh, Danny Forster Design Studio, which you can see, I guess, DannyForsterDesignStudio.com. Uh, it's a small practice we have in Brooklyn, and we have a, a couple of projects. We have a really amazing, fun residential project in, in Brooklyn. We're starting, we're doing a, a corporate headquarters for a fashion company. We have a small uh, little residential project in, um, in Chicago. But, I mean, the long story of it is that we're just trying to make sustainable, clever designs that are economical and reasonable for our clients. It's, you know, we're not doing skyscrapers, we're not doing bridges. It really is, I'm a... I'm a a small practitioner who's really just opening up my shop and, and, and getting started and, and loving the process and have a wonderful team working with me. And, uh, and other than that, uh, I've been teaching this semester at Syracuse University and teaching a class called, what's it called? Oh, the Modern, the Vernacular, the Sustainable. And it's about kind of ecotourism and sustainable development in, uh, in Punta Cana, Dominican Republic. Okay. And my students had their mid-review last Thursday. They did pretty well. Uh, they have desk crits this Thursday and Friday starting at 1 to 5. Please have your models ready for inspection, all four of them, by the way. They were given an assignment, which each one has to make four models. 
those four models have got to be done. Uh, but it's really fun to teach. It's one of the best. It's one of the best parts of uh, of what I do. And to that end, how did you get where you're at now? I mean, who influenced you? Did, um, where'd you get your start? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think in high school, I had a I had a teacher named Mrs. Devito, Carol Devito, who was my AP art history teacher, and um, and I do I mean to just not I mean I remember the story like it was yesterday, but it was a, it was a lesson she was teaching about Gothic architecture and Romanesque architecture. You know, you're just in a survey art history class. You're just trying to memorize like what year did this begin? What year did that end? What's this made of? What's a Gothic arch? What's a Romanesque arch? And she she broke it down. She was like, well, okay, the Gothic arch is tall and pointy, fine, and they have big flying buttresses, and the Romanesque arch is low and wide and kind of semicircular and heavy. And so, okay, I'm taking those notes down. She goes, well, why? Why are they like that? I'm like, I don't know. She's like, well. The Romanesque churches were out in the plains, away from cities, where there'd be marauders who would go around and try and rob people. So their churches were actually like fortified, protective buildings. So that arch was about stability. Interesting. The Gothic churches were in cities, like in Paris. And so the idea was that people lived in tiny apartments, and they'd walk into the church and would see this amazing, open, column-free space with amazing light as though it was held up by God. And it would make them believe in God, potentially. So the idea of that arch was about creating an illusion, whereas the other arch was about creating protection. So basically with that lesson plan, she kind of like explained to me that buildings have stories. And uh, and that sort of stuck with me. And then the alternative was to become a lawyer, and that seemed like an awful path. Well, we could see that obviously that <laughs> building having stories it comes alive in the show, so we can, we can thank Mrs. DeVito Mrs. for Mrs. DeVito, who is at Dwight Englewood High School to this day, still teaching AP Art History, doing an amazing job. Uh, and I've went back and I've actually lectured for her class. She is one of those, as I'm sure you know, those teachers that you know you, you are indispensable in our educational world. They change students' lives, and she did change mine. And I'm sure many others, too. Yeah, along absolutely. The way. Absolutely. Every year she's doing it to, to more and more. All right. So on to that end, what advice do you have for students aspiring to get into maybe a science, technology, engineering, or math career? Well, I think, well, I think, I think all of the science, technology, engineering, and math has gotten a pretty crappy rap in general. I mean, I think that's one of the biggest problems is that the the kind of excitement behind this sort of stuff does not get its due. It's kind of it's nerdy. It takes a lot of math. It's kind of hard. I mean, people say to me all the time, oh I, "Oh, I always wanted to be an architect, but I was never good at math and I can't draw." I'm like, "Well, I can't draw and I can't do math either. I'm not good at it, but I can think about ideas and I can work through problems, and so therefore I can design buildings." And so I think folks who are interested in science, technology, and math, the one thing to realize is that it doesn't begin and end with a physics experiment. It doesn't begin and end with a, with a calculus or geometry proof. The nice thing is there are so many phenomenally interesting careers that are connected, be it tangentially or directly to these kinds of ideas, whether you are you know, designing video games or you're working on animation for my TV show or you are a professor. There's just so many ways to skin a cat and all of those ways are predicated on having this kind of information. So. That's what I would say for one thing, is to be, be mindful of the incredible list of options that are out there that don't just involve doing geometry proofs. We don't like math here either. <laughs> at least at least the hard stuff. The traditional math. stuff, right? I mean, there's... Yeah, out of the book. Yeah, yeah exactly. We're not into that. Exactly. We're probably all thinking about that Dead Poet Society moment. Rip, all right, rip these pages out, throw them around, have a good time. Yeah, I, I think we probably lose so many kids who would love to be amazing engineers or designers or builders or architects or scientists because it doesn't necessarily feel compelling at its elementary stages when you're just like cracking the books. Mm -hmm. But I do think it sounds like the class that you teach when kids are actually like getting their hands around the application. Yeah. Well, then it gets kind of interesting. Um, and I think that's, that's the key. Do you also think it has something to do with the way those careers have been portrayed too? I mean, we always see the pocket protector nerd totally. and lab so. code, the nerd thing. I mean, that's one thing that really kind of kills me is that I hosted an event last week called Discovery Education 3M Young Scientist Challenge. Appreciate your tweets from that too. It was totally awesome. Amazing event. Ten kids, finalists from all across the country brought in because they were able to communicate an idea about science. And they brought in for this competition. Winner gets 50 grand for their education, right? Totally awesome. And first off, two things I experienced. Number one is it wasn't just about the science. It was about the communication. In other words, they can know a cool idea or have some interesting concept, but can they communicate it passionately to make other non-science lovers get fired up? I mean, that's what I think I try and do on Build It Bigger. That's what these kids were doing. But also what was great was that when these kids got together, these 10 finalists from all over the country, all, by the way, competing against each other, an amazing community was formed because they're all incredibly passionate about this stuff. Probably back home, 
I bet some of their friends called them nerds for being really into it. But together, they were like, oh, you like this? I love this too. This is amazing. Have the best time. And in 10 years, you know, they're probably going to be like inventing my rocket pack mm-hmm. and I'm going to take to work every day. We, we don't necessarily like the word nerd. We're more along the lines of geek because it's, it's a cool word and people... I agree. I mean, I am not the coolest kid. Certainly wasn't in school either. Um, but the one thing I think I got my arms around probably a little later than most is that I like this thing that I'm doing. So I'm having a much better time digging into the thing that I enjoy than trying to pretend to like the thing that everyone else likes. And it takes a while to figure that out. But man, when you do, it is liberating as all get out. Yeah. It's like, oh, I can just do this thing that I think is fun. And actually, that can be a job. What? (laughs) What? Get paid to travel. Right. Cause trouble on a construction site. Right. But, you know, but even if it's like, oh, if you really like video games, go make video games. Really? That's allowed? Like, I remember I played video games as a kid, and I was like, my mom was like, okay, that's enough. Like, what if she was like, go, do more. Go get a good job doing that. She didn't, but, you know, what if she had? Yeah, exactly. Um, some student questions here. We have Shoot. one of the students asked, what inspired you to do it bit do build it bigger? Um, the truth is it came out of a kind of a negative inspiration in that I was really kind of um, fed up with architecture school. I was fed up with the kind of academe, the, the, the closed door world of academia. I felt like I went to, to learn how to design buildings to connect with people. And I felt like grad school was really about ideas that were about very, very complicated things that had very little to do with people. The buildings, the, the reason buildings are built to serve people, right? And for me, Build It Bigger was a way to sort of, frankly, quench my frustration of trying to communicate the stuff that I love that for whatever reason I can only talk to about seven people about because we created this very elite small crew of grad school architects but I don't care what they think I care what everyone else who's not an architect thinks so for me what inspired me to get into Build It Bigger was to try and share what I like in a way that others who are not necessarily predisposed to this stuff might be able to get into it and we're just glad that you wandered from that thesis over to the Craigslist ad albeit briefly but it was a, it was a significant wandering I don't even know how you found that on Craigslist, but we're all jealous of you for that. So, uh, Another good one was, uh, what was your favorite subject in middle school? Since I in teach middle, middle school. school. In middle school. Um, let's see. Let's jump into middle Besides that, recess. That's, gym. You're right. right. Uh, no. I, was, no, I was like four feet and like 65 pounds. Oh, not gym. Gym. gym was not my favorite, I promise you. Um, middle school is what, seven, eight, and nine? Yep. Somewhere seven, around eight, and nine. God, what did I... I think... What did I dig? Um... Certainly was not Senora Obolsky's Spanish class. That's for, that's for damn sure. Um, that's for damn sure. Mrs. Lippman had a pretty awesome um, English class. Oh yeah, I liked I loved English, and um, I think I, I math was not was not not doing good in math. No English. Mrs. Lippman's English class that I very much enjoyed. Cool. And obviously that doesn't really tie in necessarily directly with the science, technology, engineering, math, the STEM that we're focusing on, but the, the student followed up with, did your love for that subject inspire you to get involved in a STEM career? No. I mean, I think I came to it organically in that I found out, I almost got to it through the humanities or the history track in that I got interested in buildings from a sort of historical perspective. I really loved the fact that the, the sort of history of a city or a culture or a period of time or a technology could be understood through a building. And then I, f- I never thought I could actually design buildings. I just wanted to study them. And then slowly over time, I sort of said, someone said to me, it's like, why do you study other people's work? Why don't you go make some work of your own? Hmm. And I kind of found my way into it that way. So I, I backed into the, the STEM curriculum. But now that I'm in it and a part of it and a, and a, and a sort of active participant in it, um, I definitely am able to look back and realize that it was not sold to me in the right way. Um, I stayed away for the wrong reasons. Mm-hmm. Because uh, I didn't get that it was fascinating. I didn't get that it did relate to me. Very good. And, and one last one, even though we kind of covered it. Did you know the show would involve heights before you joined? I will swear to you, uh, in the most honest I can say to you, my first television program I ever made was about the Arizona Cardinals football stadium in Glendale, Arizona. My third day on the job, meaning my third day ever shooting television, I went up in a cherry picker to interview this iron worker. And it broke, and we almost got killed. My third day in the job, literally almost died. Like my third day ever making television. And by the way, in that moment, you're saying to yourself, "You're such an idiot. You're gonna die because you had to be on TV. Really? You really? It's gonna go like this?" And I'm up there, and as I'm going up, I look over my cameraman. I said to him, "I kid you not." And I was like, "I knew we were gonna go two buildings, but no one ever said we had to go on top of them." And as we're going up, I looked down. And I was like, "Great. This was not in the brief." So I had no idea. I figured we'd run around and touch things, and then you know, no clue we'd be on top of buildings. 
That was that was not no one no one no one made any mention of that when I signed the contract. <laughs> I'm just gonna say that. Uh, we won't hold it against them though, because we <laughs> we like seeing you up there. It adds a an interesting dynamic to the show too. It certainly seems to, because every time I get to a building, the first thought is, can we go up there? <laughs> Unfortunately. And why do they always make you go on the elevator on the outside of the building? I always wonder. It's like, is there not a safer way to do this? Like in every construction site, in every culture, in every kind of economic situation all over the world, it's always clicking on a little metal shed on the side of a building which looks attached by a staple and that's the only way to get up and down the building like no one is like didn't we put a man on the moon yeah like Google just invented a car that drives without a person iPhone 4 lots of technology make a better elevator on construction site guys please this is like a little it's it's like a a a desire I'm I'm wishing it out there construction workers please help me out here build a better elevator for me the iron workers might get mad though because they probably like that ride on the outside they do they do what can I say? The, back, back in the day, by the way, iron workers used to tell me they would actually grab to the they'd tie to the cable of the crane and ride it down. That'd be fun, huh? And what do they say? Yeah. It's faster. Yeah. And they're probably sad they can't do it because of OSHA now. Like OSHA. Oh, I got to say, God bless OSHA. I love me some OSHA. I love me some OSHA. Love me tying <laughs> off. Love me some OSHA. <laughs> uh, that's too funny. One of the questions we're probably going to ask all of our guests once we get to it is, what does STEM mean to you? Like, how would you tell other people about it? Um, STEM to me, and, and my involvement with it thus far with some of the incredible teachers who I've gotten to collaborate with, is about putting people, passionate people, behind incredibly important curricular ideas and getting it to students in a way they've never gotten it before. Because science, technology, engineering, math has always been there. But we are realizing now that it is critical to not just the students' success, the future of their careers, but our country. Well, let's be honest. I mean, these are quantifiable ways for us to realize that we're keeping pace as a nation, and we're not. And so for me, STEM is very much about putting people who, frankly, in the past weren't always the most passionate teachers, right? We think of the amazing English teacher or the clever historicist, but we always think of the boring math teacher and the nerdy uh, science teacher. That's not true anymore. It may have been true 30 years ago, but it's not true now. And so for me, STEM is about enabling and celebrating these incredibly passionate educators who are able to communicate to these students that this curriculum is not just important, but it's awesome. It's legitimately fun. And uh, so that's that's what it means to me. That's why we love Discovery. I mean, Mythbusters, uh, your show. I mean, where can you go wrong? I mean, Mike Rowe even getting into dirty jobs. I mean, that's just showing a different side of the world that we live in. We don't ever think about half the time. And, and Discovery Channel, Science Channel, The Learning Channel, Planet Green, Discovery Health, you know, all of our, Investigation Discovery, all of our channels, the entire family of Discovery Channel has one simple basic premise, which is that let's ask questions about our incredibly fascinating and, and curious world and figure out, what, and, and experiment with what we find. You know, we, we don't know the answers, right? But we are all passionate with questions. And we're going to go at those questions with a degree of expertise. You know, we're not we're not, uh, we're, not, we're not all TV hosts. I mean, we are people in a career, uh, in a discipline, who are doing that kind of investigative work and doing it on a, in, you know, on a TV show. Exactly. Well, we'd love to thank you for your time today and just talking to our students and whoever else listens in. So. Well, thank you. Um, I hope this, this, this continues and you get more folks to get involved with STEM and, and talk more about this stuff because it is the future. It is fascinating. Uh, I'm thrilled to be a part of it. Thank you very much. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so there you have it. A really great interview by Danny Forster. Uh, We really enjoyed it. We hope you enjoyed it too. Uh, There's lots more work to be done. We need to go out and find more guests. We have a few in mind. Um, Certainly, we're trying to line those up right now as we speak. Um, We'll keep you posted on our blog and on our website. Again, that's almostrocketscience.com. We certainly hope that you'll wander over to Discovery Networks and check out not only uh, the Science Channel's Build It Bigger uh, site to see when the new episodes will be coming out with this new season, but also you'll check out Danny's project, The Rising. Um, Again, just really awesome guest, and we really enjoyed having him. And again, we hope you take advantage of this. We need uh, all the help we can get with the Almost Rocket Science podcast and blog. And really, uh, the key there is just getting your input, your involvement. So stop on by, share any ideas you might have, ask questions. Don't be afraid to give us really crazy guest ideas. I mean, we got Danny Forrester. We figure we can get more with your help. And if you know of somebody or if you're somebody who really wants to come on the show, please head over to the site and use the Contact Us page. Uh, Again, thank you so much for listening, and we really hope we make a success out of it. Uh, And we uh, can only do that with your help, too. 
So thanks again. Have a great week. And hopefully we'll see you in a week or two with a new podcast. For now, that's the Almost Rocket Science crew signing off. If you have questions, comments, or suggestions for Almost Rocket Science, visit our site at www.almostrocketscience.com and use the Contact Us form there. Almost Rocket Science is produced and edited by Jeff Bergen and Rhett Youngberg. Thanks again for listening.